Good morning, and thank you all very much for joining us again uh, here today. Good to see uh, some perhaps slightly bleary-eyed people here after uh, our, dinner, our dinner last night. Um, but I'm delighted uh, to introduce again one of our What to Watch panels with some of uh, Glimmer Green's best reporters and editors. Um, we're going to talk you through COP so far, what are the events of the day that we're looking for, and then maybe look a little bit ahead to the next, uh, to the, to the next few days. So Akshat, let me start with you. We got a draft, I think we're calling it a communique or a statement from the UK presidency overnight. Can you just talk us a little bit through what we saw in this draft? Um, and where we, how those negotiations might play out over the next few days. So it's uh, actually three documents, uh, 14 pages, 159 paragraphs. I've not been able to read all of them <laughs> because they've just dropped. But we do have some highlights, and these are these are documents that would be essentially uh, the consensus that comes through at the end of the meeting. Uh, these are the documents that they will be um, negotiating every word over. Um, and some of these documents, I mean, these are conclusion documents. They'll f other aspects of what is happening at COP will feed into them. So we've talked about Article 6 and the creation of a carbon market. That's a separate discussion, which will then in end up as a line in the document. Uh, we've talked about a discussion around adaptation and loss and damage, which will also end up in the document as a line. So now, in terms of highlight, uh, for the first time, uh, we have a document from uh, the, the COP meeting that says, that uses the word fossil fuels, mm -hmm. uh, which you know, many of you may not have uh, known, but the Paris Agreement doesn't mention fossil fuels because there was a lot of pressure from fossil fuel uh, countries to not have that phrase used. And in this document, it is very clear. It says we are going to phase out the use of coal and subsidies for fossil fuels, which is a highlight. Uh, there is language to try and uh, update NDCs, which are these naturally determined contributions that countries uh, have to put to the UN as part of their pledge to try and reduce emissions towards uh, the Paris goals of uh, 2 degrees Celsius or 1.5 degrees Celsius. Typically, they were updated every five years. So Glasgow was the fifth year, um, even though it was you know, sixth because of the pandemic. Uh, where NDCs were updated. Now they're calling for that to be updated by the end of 2022 mm -hmm. so that there can be another stock take in 2023 and they have 1.5 degrees Celsius in there. So those were two big highlights that came through. There was also mention of some of the side deals. So we heard about these side deals about forests and coal and methane. The one that I could find was forests. I couldn't find coal. So um, there is some push to try and get that. Uh, language in there in the final document. We were expecting this to come at midnight. It came at 6 a.m. So clearly they they stayed up all night uh, trying to trying to hash out the documents. Yes, and so please keep an eye on Bloomberg Green in the course of the day as we sort of tried to break news on where the arguments and where the where the fights were as that te text was wrangled out. Can you talk to us a little bit? Why does it matter that the NDC NDCs get updated every year? I mean, it sort of sounds like a bureaucratic. Uh, point, but why does it matter? So we know that one of the things that is different about this energy transition, especially because of the past decade, is that technology is getting cheaper faster. Mm -hmm. And we also know that access to finance is improving because uh, the financial industry realizes the energy transition's importance. And both those forces are going to be crucial in helping countries meet those goals. Um, the five-year period was decided arbitra mm. arbitrarily that countries m you know, may be able to come through and do it. But it's clear now that if you do it more frequently, we'll have a better uh, handle on how quickly we are going as a world. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's no reason. I mean, the UN has made it clear there's no reason every country can up submit it as frequently as they would like. Mm. Uh, but just to be able to do a stock take and synthesize where all the countries are, it would be good to have it more frequently. Mm -hmm. And we got a car deal or, or, or a pact or agreement again. I'm not quite sure exactly how these. Yes, I think this or how binding they are. But can you talk to us a little bit about that? So this probably is it's transport day today, mm -hmm. and this is probably the last of the big side deals we are going to get. I mentioned methane, forests, and coal, um, and the car deal is in two parts. Uh, there's one from the UK about ending the sale of. Uh, fossil fuel cars and vans uh, in developed countries by 2035 and in developing countries by 2040. 
Uh, some 10 countries have joined it. The, the largest markets, the US and China, have not. Uh, and then there's, there's a second deal on trucks, uh, which looks to, uh, which is from the Netherlands, which is going to have 30% of sale of all trucks be electric by 2030. 100% uh, sales by 2014, and no fossil fuel trucks by 2050, mm -hmm. and some 13 countries have joined it or more. Mm -hmm. um, these side deals also have a number of state actors and uh, companies joining them. Uh, so for the electric car deal, uh, I understand Ford, GM, Daimler, BYD, Volvo are all involved. Um, and then there are states involved as well, New York State, Washington, and California, uh, but there are other states and all. So overall, again, very early days, this l just landed. Um, I know you're in touch with a lot of the negotiators, with a lot of the NGOs, with a lot of the activists um, here in Glasgow. Can you give us, like, um, to the extent that you can so early, um, can you give us an overall sense of this draft statement? Does it sort of meet some of the hopes and aspirations of people t pushing for a tougher climate action? Is it disappointing? How would you characterize it right now? So one of the things about this draft document and why it's being given that importance is um, it will change quite a bit. There will be additions and deletions, but typically the concepts or the big ideas are baked in. Mm -hmm. That's why it comes at this point. That's why there was the six hour negotiation after the midnight deadline. Um, and on that, there is some happiness about fossil fuels being included. Um, there was some pushback on financing because uh, the numbers around financing mm -hmm. were all in square brackets, which you're going to hear a lot about. These are undecided pieces of text within mm -hmm. the document. And so there was a little bit of a push on, on finance, both for developing countries, but also for adaptation. Mm -hmm. um, and that, I think, will be the pushback. So we're going to see how, how, the, how boxing gloves come out mm -hmm. in, in the next few days and, and who gets uh, their way in with the document. Right. Looking forward to it. Caroline. Um, Caroline is our Bloomer Green reporter um, in Beijing. Um, can you talk to us a little bit? I mean, again, there's been a lot, there was a lot of conversation, a lot of talk before coming into COP that she, President Xi wasn't here, posing questions about China's commitment um, to this COP. Can you give us a sense of, of the Chinese position and all of these various issues um, over, over, the last, uh, over the last 10 days? Um, I think uh, I met some like negotiators at uh, all kinds of events. I think they've been like, just like uh, China's climate envoy uh, has been uh, stressing uh, before COP and during the COP that China is a developing country. So like when uh, countries talk about the climate issues here, uh, China requests or ask developed countries to first uh, get the money there, mm -hmm. right? Like that, they, they've been say, saying that this is one of the core issues that hasn't been uh, achieved, the re solution hasn't been there. So some people say like, right now at this stage, if this uh, major issue is not solved and you go to all the side deals or other like topics, it's mm -hmm. like, they call it like a distraction. Mm -hmm. So China first stressed that it is a developing country, so it's doing its uh, fair share of the uh, contribution to fighting climate change. And some people in the negotiation team saying uh, China's effort uh, has not been uh, fully recognized mm -hmm. by the world. Uh, they say like last since last year, actually China like made several like big announcements, including the carbon like peak emission and the carbon neutral goal. Mm -hmm. And also like this year, China announced to stop finance, stop building our co plants. So like uh, people in China, officials, they say like we have done this much, but mm -hmm. at the same time we always just hear like criticism, and this is unfair. Mm -hmm. So that is the thing like I think it's very clearly in China's like. Um, the, the men, like their, their stance, so the country needs um, yeah, position. Mm -hmm. And we had, we had um, uh, US climate envoy Kerry um, in, in here yesterday talking to our uh, editor in chief. He said he is up until 3 a.m. every day, every night, talking to Beijing, talking to the Chinese negotiators, trying to get them to sign up to various things, including the methane. Uh, pledge. Do you see, from your conversations, do you see any sign that, or, or any potential that perhaps China could sign up for the methane deal, which would be a really big deal mm. 
towards the end of this COP if it were to happen? Uh, I think there are a few things, right? Like uh, um, last week, uh, I think Tuesday or Wednesday, at China's like the official like daily uh, presser at foreign ministry, some journalists ask uh, about this issue. Mm -hmm. Like, is China willing to cooperate with other countries on this thing? And the spokesperson said, like, we are willing to cooperate. But again, like you can expect the following line is like mm. at the same time there are so many issues in Paris Agreement that hasn't been uh, we haven't found a solution yet. So right now we are willing to, but I think there's always like it depends on mm. what to come. Uh, and also like yeah, a few days ago, uh, some people in here in the delegation said. Uh, he basically said uh, this deal is uh, like a distraction from mm -hmm. the main uh, task as a COP this year. And he again said like this is um, developed countries, mm -hmm. like historical, you know, contribution to this issue again. So they need to see like more commitment from developed countries. Actually, you wanted to get in on that. Yes. I just wanted to ask a question about, uh, we looked at an, an analysis about how if the next 30 years or 40 years of emissions are taken into consideration, that China will then become the largest historical emitter. How do you think China understands that? So right now, the US is the largest historical emitter. But if business as usual stays, China will unseat the US in that position. Mm. And is there, does that give China, the, I mean, it seems to me that that's the reason China shouldn't get any excuse to try and not reduce emissions. Yeah, actually, very interestingly, is that you know in Copenhagen, uh, the climate talk, uh, China's main position, like in all the negotiation, the argument is China's per capita uh, emission is so low. So, like if China, like compared to like countries like the U.S., you know China is not contributing that much, especially when you look at China's big population. But interestingly, that this year or in recent few years, China no longer say that because as we see like China's per capita emission is rising and very fast. And I'm very interested to see like if the position of the historical, as you said, this emission, this uh, historical uh, emission contribution will gradually uh, get out of China's like, you know, the, the, the negotiation point. Um, so that is very interesting, but I also want to say something about uh, like domestic audience, how they talk about climate, international climate uh, negotiations, is that like this interesting like research, I don't think that is uh, very well known in China, like in including like the per capita emission. So people, like if you ask people in China, like what do you think about climate change? I think I would say like a majority of people would still give you the two reasons, like, China is a country with big population, mm -hmm. and China developed so late, right? So, I I will be very very happy to see like more uh, conversation, domestic conversation, uh, getting big on climate change. But again, I think it requires a strong civil society, NGOs, mm -hmm. and people from all levels to push the conversation to get bigger and stronger. And speaking about the the domestic audience in China, can you? You know, obviously the UK media, the European media, the US media, a lot of attention on COP. It's been, if not front page news, then very prominently played um, in a lot of the media in the West. Can you talk to us a little bit about how COP is being represented in state media in China? Or do, would people even know it's happening? <laughs> I, I think people know like there is a very big climate talk happening in the UK and there's a lot of problems mm -hmm. in the UK. I think people would like stress that oh, the COVID situation in the UK is so bad, so people must be careful. Uh, at least like uh, last week, especially the beginning two days with the global leaders, you mm. know, there were so many people at the queue. And that was definitely one of the things that got most attention in China, in Chinese media. Mm. Like, oh, this is like so many people waiting in the queue. And you can imagine like what the COVID is going to like in a few weeks. Mm. Um, and also, well, we are here talking about like she's not being here and China's being a little bit quiet on stage. Um, but in China, if you look at Chinese media, it looks like well, a lot of focus is on China's big contribution. You know, Xi Jinping's uh, even the written statement 
oh, like since last year, what China has been done, mm -hmm. rather than what are the detailed issues mm -hmm. that hasn't been decided, what are the like difficulties um, at the meetings here, and. Uh, yeah, I want to just tell a like, little bit, uh, like an anecdote in last week's uh, press with uh, China's climate envoy, uh, Xie Zhenhua. And a, a reporter, an American reporter, asked him to, oh, can you, uh, is, is that possible, like you can maybe answer the question in English? And he said, can you, um, can you ask the question in mm. Chinese? Mm. <laughs> so like this one was not really like a picked up yes. uh, among the media here. But yesterday, uh, or, the, or maybe the day before yesterday, uh, state media Xinhua News Agency made this a big like front page story. <laughs> basically like the highlight is basically like Xie Zhenhua smiling and say, can you Answer, ask the question in Chinese. Mm. I think the context of this anecdote yes. is like China's increasingly seeing itself as, um, you know, one more position on global stage. Mm -hmm. And domestically, there's a lot of this kind of content definitely got so much audience because of all the geopolitical mm. situation of China's like uh, ever strong uh, public voice trying to convince people especially domestically, that mm -hmm. China is, you know, the new leaders mm -hmm. in the world. So, you know, they require some kind of change in the, like, In terms of international China. perception, yeah. yeah. And a final question, of course, this is all taking place against the backdrop of the Communist Party's plenum, which mm -hmm. started this week. How does that, does, it, does that play in any way into China's stance on, on COP? Is there any chance, perhaps, that after the plenum is over, that we could actually see a surprise announcements from China? Um, before, in the weeks before COP, uh, experts and people close to the climate negotiation were expecting China to, of course, like incre uh, improve the uh, NDC like mm -hmm. the targets. And maybe one main thing is uh, the cap emission that uh, yeah China hasn't uh, announced, but a lot of people expect China to do. But maybe yes, after. Mm -hmm. The thing is, like, we never know when because clearly, like, China doesn't want to bring that big gift to here mm -hmm. at the meeting that the UK is hosting. Um, but yeah, as you said, like this week, interestingly, the the parties like six uh, plenum, which is very important for the party and for Xi Jinping to in order to secure the, uh, the third term. Mm -hmm. So that is very important. That is the biggest news uh, in China right mm -hmm. now. So a lot of attention domestically is on this meeting rather than what is going on here in Glasgow. Okay. But yeah, so I mean like, just like last year when nobody was expecting China to announce the carbon uh, neutrality mm -hmm. deadline, then China announced, so maybe yeah, after this meeting, we will see something. Good. Well, you'll let us know if you see it. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> everyone. <laughs> Aaron, you came in on, on Sunday, so halfway through, um, halfway through COP. I'm sort of keen to hear from you your sort of perceptions, your sort of takeaways from COP so far, and perhaps also, and yesterday, of course, we had our Bloomberg Green Summit, so also sort of keen to hear from you what were your sort of impressions of that, what, what were some of the most interesting takeaways for you uh, from the summit? Well, coming in late means that I have an outside perspective from the first week, but also I'm better rested than Carolyn and Akshat who've been <laughs> at this for so long. Uh, you know, it, it, coming in from the outside, it really does feel uh, like what's happening in here, the full intensity of it isn't really capable of being reflected to the outside, no matter how many stories you read, no matter mm -hmm. how much coverage. There is like a, a interior space to this world as it's developing here that's just not easy to capture when you're looking at it from afar. And then at yesterday's event, I mean, I think it was super interesting, of course, to have U.S. climate envoy John Kerry here in the middle of the talks. I mean, you, you mentioned him talking about being up to 3 a.m. You can kind of hear it in his voice. Uh, I think it was particularly fascinating to watch him sort of um, uh, insist on a significance in practical terms for what's been accomplished so far, even when there's you know, a, a, someone interviewing him, like our editor-in-chief is able to kind of puncture some of the uh, failures or some of the disappointments. 
uh, you know, he kept facing the question as to why the U.S. hasn't joined the coal side deal and, and neither has China. And he said some things that I hadn't quite heard him say so directly before, like that the U.S., even though they're not in the deal, will be coal free in its power sector by 2030. So that was a sort of interesting way to insist on significance, even if it's not a part of the formal deal. Mm -hmm. um, it was really interesting to see him citing some of the research that I feel like is usually the um, precinct of wonkier writers like Akshat about uh, how you can measure the uh, impact of agreements so far in degrees of warming. I mean, that was just a really interesting way to have him talk about, uh, talk about it in a really concrete uh, degrees way. And I also thought it was um, in, a, in a way that sort of uh, reflected the uh, structure of our event. He talked about the need for the private sector. You know, mm -hmm. he talked about how uh, there's only so far that uh, the increase in government ambitions can go and that the scope of the transition is going to be something that needs to have uh, its acceleration happening in private sector. And then so our, our, at our event, there were just a lot of CEOs and business leaders who were talking about the ways that the raised ambition can come from the work that they're doing. Um, so in a, in a day-long discussion that sort of started with John Kerry uh, indicating the importance of the private sector, it was, it was really interesting to see CEOs of cosmetics companies, consumer product companies, automakers all here talking about their work and raising ambitions. And then in another way that, that sort of thematically worked out is in the evening we had a panel with youth activists. Mm -hmm. And it was really fascinating to hear them talk about their work in terms of uh, accelerating things and, and being a force that pushes for change to happen faster. And for the rest of the week, what are you sort of most interested, most excited to, to see? Well, because we've been hosting events here, I actually have to admit that I haven't crossed the line into COP myself yeah. yet. So I really want to go in and see, uh, you know, see where all of the action is happening. And then I'm, I, you know, the pattern historically has been that this goes into overtime. So it's going to be an uh, interesting process to watch unfold the, the draft statement that we had today, how it gets more specific and how it changes in mm. the kind of last mile that we're in now. And um, you obviously edit the Bloomberg Green magazine, which is everyone here should pick up a copy of if you haven't already. A fantastic series of, of features and articles on methane and, and various other issues. I'm going to put you on the spot now, sort of looking ahead into 2022. What do you see as the most interesting climate themes that you want to sink your teeth into? From well, here, you know, one thing that I'm really pleased to see that we've developed a framework for trying to understand methane has been such a big part of the discussion here mm -hmm. today, and it's on the cover of this magazine. But I really think it's only the beginning of how we can use it as a storytelling tool. Mm -hmm. um, we know that there's going to be an increasing level of technological sophistication for seeing emissions as they're happening. So it it makes it somewhat different than I think the framework from six years ago that built the Paris Agreement and sort of the way things go up to now where we're, we've up to now been looking at very big numbers in terms of global emissions and now we're gonna be able to do increasing work that ties emissions to the actors who are mm -hmm. creating them. So some of the stories that we've been telling recently look at individual countries like Turkmenistan but they also look at individual companies and their outsized emissions footprints that have up to now not been disclosed and I think that inability for emitters to uh, n remain undisclosed in their footprint is something that's gonna change. And for our work next year, I think that's gonna really, um, when, when Akshat talks about how uh, one of the pressures that's on right now is to reevaluate your NDCs uh, each year as opposed to doing it in a five year window, I think that's one of the things that's gonna be changing in just in the next, you know, the next six months, the next year. We're gonna be able to tell a lot of different stories that we weren't able to see before because of the technological detection change. Yep. And we saw a great presentation yesterday from, I think it was the CEO of Planet, who sort of gave us a walkthrough of their incredible new sort of data mapping, satellite data mapping tools. And as a reminder, you can actually see all the panels, I think, on, on our YouTube channel and on our Bloomberg Green website if you want to go back and watch um, some of those. So Akshat, as the, Aaron has called you the wonk on this panel, so I'm going to bring it back to you to talk about uh, some of the, probably the, the wonkiest topic hanging over all of this. So. We're expecting this statement. We'll see what's in it. We've had a lot of side deals. People are, are already, scientists are already crunching the numbers yep. to figure out you know, if everyone did everything that they say they would do. This is where it leaves us in terms of degrees of warming. Yep. And the debate is quite broad. Yes. Right? The, 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 sort of the fan chart of possibilities is still quite broad. And there's something, there's a heated debate getting going 
amongst all the climate scientists on this. Do you want to sort of walk the audience through that debate and how we should maybe think about this? Yeah. So you all probably know about the 1.5 degrees Celsius and 2 degrees Celsius targets. Now, those are just targets, political targets. They are not scientific targets. They are not uh, levels of warming after which suddenly something happens. Um, essentially, every 0.1 degree Celsius of warming makes the planet worse. And so one of the things that we learned uh, in the IPCC report that came out in August, uh, you know, this 3,000 page document that uh, scientists work on for seven years before it's published, um, is that, which is there are going to be tipping points at some point, we don't know when they are, which is the reason why every 0.1 degree Celsius of warming matters. So now if we look at where we are right now, um, going into uh, COP26, if we looked at all the net zero pledges that had been announced, warming was at about 2.1 degrees Celsius. And that over the period of the last two weeks with new net zero announcements, with new short term goals has fallen to 1.8 degrees Celsius. So that 0.3 degrees Celsius is quite remarkable mm -hmm. um, as, an, as, a, as an achievement of progress within the two weeks of, of COP26. Now, they are all, of course, dependent on the pledges becoming reality. And we also need to realize that the 1.8 degrees Celsius is a median range. It's the median probability uh, for, for what is, as you described, a fan mm -hmm. of uh, possible outcomes. And if we look at the fan of possible outcomes, even in the most optimistic scenario, we are at 1.5, but three degrees Celsius is still within sight. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, the, it's the line that Stan, Kim Stanley Robinson, who was here at the panel made, he said, you don't need to be in a plane crash to imagine mm -hmm. what it would be like. And that is what three degrees Celsius would look like. And even in the most optimistic scenario, that still remains a possibility. Uh, and that's why there is so much push to try and cut emissions faster uh, and deeper. And just to sort of a lay person, are all of these scientists you know, the, who are producing these models, are they all basically using the same model and the same data? Or is there a lot of controversy or, or debate about what particular models to use? They don't, <coughs> but they, uh, there is a lot of debate around modeling. Um, and lots of uh, scientists do their own modeling, but eventually they find ways to make it all speak together and then mm. come to a, a unified conclusion around where the uncertainties lie. And that's why w and whenever there is an announcement around where we are headed, it's always a probabilistic range with a midpoint. And you, mm. you usually read the midpoint in news stories because it's simpler to explain to the reader. Um, and that debate is going to continue for quite some time. Computer modeling is getting really good. Right. As we saw with satellite data, uh, we are getting much better at being able to understand how the weather is going to play out. But we'll never be perfect because of the sheer number of variables that are included in, in these models and in the real world. <coughs> um, and that's why the insurance policy of trying to ensure that the worst case scenarios are no longer yeah. in sight. When you talk about the range of possible outcomes and the kind of optimism with the realism, I, I thought a lot about something John Kerry said at the end of his uh, interview yesterday where uh, he talked about, you know, is there a chance that the like, global population will, uh, you know, get, get turned off by some of the net zero politics that seem to be mm -hmm. uh, a fixation in a business leaders in a diplomatic context like this. And his insistence was that the, uh, there will be millions of people uh, in, in any realistic near future on the move as a result of climate change. And that will be something that brings an intensity and a focus to this, no matter what people think right now about net zero. And to see someone who was here as a statesman talking about the optimistic interpretations of what has been achieved so far and what ho hope to be achieved by the end of COP, also talking about the near future in those terms was something really bracing, I thought, that came out of yesterday. Yeah, that was really quite a moment. Well, we are out of time. Uh, thank you all so much again for your perspectives. It promises to be uh, an exciting and interesting and long week, I think. So um, I can't promise that we'll have another one of these at 3 a.m. on Sunday morning when this is wrapped up. But thank you so much. This is really interesting. Thank you. Thank you.